Okay, so welcome back tonight. Um, we are going to be doing the um, digest digestive system, or the lecture is digestion and nutrition. So we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, where certain nutrients are absorbed in the digestive tract, and we'll talk a little bit about certain vitamins that are digested, um, or I should say absorbed, um, in the digestive tract at certain points. So um, let's go ahead and get started. And you'll be happy to know that after this lecture, you only have two left. So you'll just have the urinary um, system and the reproductive system. So again, we're, we're really wrapping things up at the end of the semester here. Um, so let me just go ahead and set my pen color for tonight. And, oh, just so that you know, I'm actually going to split this lecture up. Um, unfortunately, I recorded this lecture once already, and um, it, it's about two hours, and at the very end of it, the system crashed on me, and so um, I don't think that it can handle the full two-hour lecture. So, I'm going to break this up into digestive system part one and digestive system part two. Um, so, so we're, we're doing take two on this lecture here. Okay, so when we talk about digestion, um, digestion refers to both the mechanical and the chemical breakdown of foods so that obviously nutrients can then be absorbed across um, the intestinal lining and into the bloodstream and then eventually um, again be transferred to the cells of the body. The digestive system consists of what's called the alimentary canal. Um, this is literally the what I call the donut hole, <laughs> the the from mouth to anus. Um, it's the, literally, if you could picture, we're like a big donut, and from mouth to anus, again, um, that would be the alimentary canal. And some things get absorbed into the donut, and some things go in and out of um, the donut hole and are never absorbed. And so we'll talk about things like um, what makes up your digestive fiber in your diet, um, cellulose, which is mainly cellulose from plants. We can't digest that. We don't have the enzymes to break it down. So it literally goes in the donut hole and out the donut hole. And then we also have several accessory organs um, like the liver and the gallbladder, um, the pancreas, um, your salivary glands, um, whose secretions are going to aid in the process of digestion. So we'll talk about all those enzymes and their role in, again, helping to break down the macromolecules of the body. So again, here's just a, a, a summary slide that shows you all the accessory organs that we just talked about, the salivary glands, um, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And we're going to talk individually about what each of these do. And then um, the alimentary canal, um, which includes the mouth, okay, and then the pharynx. So the mouth leads into the pharynx, and if you remember, the pharynx is broken down into the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and then the laryngeopharynx. And then um, the pharynx will connect the mouth to the esophagus. And the esophagus is this long tube that leads into the stomach, or it will actually push the food bolus into the stomach. And so then the stomach, okay, um, down here is, if you can see it um, behind the liver there, um, there's the stomach. And again, of course, it, the stomach is going to aid in um, some chemical digestion. It mixes the food with the enzymatic secretions. We'll talk about that. And then it's going to push the food into the small intestine. The small intestine is all this stuff in here. Um, so again, the small intestine is the longest portion of the alimentary canal. And um, we'll talk about why that is in terms of um, what the function of the small intestine is. And then the small intestine leads into the large intestine. And we'll talk about um, the large intestine being broken down into um, a couple of different parts, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and then the sigmoid colon, the S-shaped portion here called the sigmoid colon, and then the rectum. Um, the large intestine then leads into the rectum, and then the rectum out to the anus. So those are the, the major structures of the alimentary canal and then the accessory organs. And these together make up the digestive system as a whole. 
So the alimentary canal um, is a big muscular tube. It's about nine meters long. Um, so if you were able to take out your whole, again, um, alimentary canal, it would be about nine meters long in length. And it passes, again, through the body's ventral cavity. So again, the more anterior or ventral cavity. And so as you can see here, they break it down um, just like we talked about. Again, you have the mouth that would lead into the um, pharynx, that would lead into the esophagus, um, that would lead into the stomach here, and then the stomach leads into the small intestines. And the small intestines is actually broken up into three different parts. Um, the first portion of the small intestine is called the duodenum, and the duodenum then leads into the jejunum. So here we get into this starting here, and then all the way down here is the jejunum. And then we have the ileum, is the last portion of the small intestine. So it goes duodenum, jejunum, ileum. I don't have any trick for you to remember um, the order of that, um, but you, if you can just kind of get in the habit of knowing that it's the duodenum first, then the jejunum, then the ileum last. And the ileum then um, will meet up with a small in, or the, with a large intestine at what's called the cecum. So the cecum is the very first part of the large intestine. And then the large intestine here um, is actually broken down into the um, ascending colon, the transverse colon, and then the descending colon, and then the S-shaped sigmoid colon. And then that leads into the rectum and the anus. So that covers the entire alimentary canal. Okay, so now let's talk about the structure of the wall of the alimentary canal. It's going to consist of these four major layers. Um, and these four major layers you're going to find actually are going to be consistent throughout the length of the alimentary canal. Um, they just are, are going to vary. So each layer might vary in thickness and size um, depending upon where it is in the alimentary canal. So these are the four major layers. There's the tunica mucosa, tunica submucosa, tunica muscularis, and tunica serosa. And so this is the innermost layer that would be um, if here if you have a cross section through the alimentary canal. Um, the tunica mucosa would be the closest to the donut hole, which would be the lumen. Okay, the what we call the lumen would be where the food is trapped, the food bolus is traveling through the alimentary canal. And so the tunica mucosa is going to be the innermost layer here, and the serosa, tunica serosa, is going to be the outermost layer. And let me just show you a quick picture so you have um, an idea of what this looks like in your mind. So again here this inner layer is called um, the tunica mucosa and the mucosa layer um, is going to be important for housing um, many glands that do a lot of secretion. So this is where this layer is very important for secreting digestive enzymes and mucus. And then we have the layer above this is called the submucosa. So this is the tunica submucosa. And the submucosa layer it consists of a lot of connective tissue with um, blood vessels and nerves running through it. And then you do have some glands as well. And then you have the... Um, the muscularis layer, and this muscularis layer is going to consist of two different layers of muscle. So you're going to have the um, longitudinal uh, muscle layer, which is this outer layer, and then the circular muscle layer here. So the circular muscle layer is just like it sounds, it kind of encircles the alimentary canal, and the longitudinal uh, muscle here um, is going to run lengthwise along the alimentary canal. And then the outermost layer um, is going to be called the serosa. And the serosa is um, all of this stuff here. And the serosa um, is basically going to be some connective tissue and this lay outer layer right here is actually the visceral peritoneum. Remember that word, peritoneum? Um, so it's one of the serous membranes. So this is, this is part of the visceral peritoneum, this outer layer here. And it will secrete serous fluid between it and the parietal peritoneum. Okay, so let's go back and go through these um, 
each of these layers. So, and again, I kind of, I'm going to be kind of recapping what I just told you um, in the last slide here, but at least it's all written out for you. So, the inner layer again is called the mucosa, and it's lined with epithelial cells, and that's important because again, remember that um, in the these epithelial tissues, we have um, lots of glands that can do secretion. So um, it's important to remember that it's lined with epithelium and it's attached to some connective tissue that, that helps to hold it in place. Um, it protects the tissues. Its main function here is to protect the tissues of the canal, um, so especially from um, it, you know the acid um, kind that will be moved on from the stomach into the intestines. And it's also going to carry out secretion and absorption. So it's going to be secreting um, a lot of digestive enzymes and especially um, in the small intestine, it's going to be involved with absorption, with absorbing nutrients right across the surface of the mucosa. So the next layer is the submucosa. Um, and just like I talked about, it's made up mostly of this loose connective tissue and it's going to house blood vessels and lymph vessels and nerves. So um, it, it's going to be responsible for nourishing the surrounding layers of the canal because it's what houses the blood vessels. So nutrients can move from the blood vessels, again, into the surrounding cells and then can be passed on from cell to cell um, through the surrounding layers of the canal. The muscular layer, muscularis layer, is going to consist of inner circular fibers, just like we talked about, and outer longitudinal fibers. And these are going to be very important for um, propelling food through the canal and also for mixing food in the canal. The outer layer, or what we call the serosa, um, is composed primarily of the visceral peritoneum and then some connective tissue. So remember that visceral peritoneum um, helps to protect um, some of the underlying tissues and most importantly it's going to secrete serous fluid to keep the canal from sticking to other tissues in the abdominal cavity especially as it's contracting so it will also help to reduce friction as you have things like peristaltic contractions occurring um, in the alimentary canal so remember that you know here, here is the alimentary canal, um, and here is your serosa here. The serosa is going to be the innermost layer, which would be the visceral, right, um, peritoneum. And remember that um, just like any serous membrane, it's going to fold back on itself, right? And then there's the parietal peritoneum. So the serosa... The uh, serosa layer is made up of only the visceral peritoneum. And that visceral peritoneum is going to secrete the serous fluid, okay, here, that help to keep, again, um, the alimentary canal from sticking um, to any other tissues. And also, it'll help to reduce friction as peristaltic contractions occur through the alimentary canal. Okay, so again, and this is just the same picture that we... we just looked at. So again, from the esophagus all the way to the anal canal, the walls of the GI tract are going to have these same four tunics. So again, the tunica mucosa, tunica submucosa, the tunica muscularis, and the tunica serosa. Okay. Mm. Now what's interesting is the mucosa layer will look different in different parts of the alimentary canal. So remember we said they still have these four same layers, but these four layers may have slight variations depending upon where they are in the alimentary canal. So, for example, um, the mucosa will, inside the stomach, actually have these big muscular folds um, that we're going to call rugi in the stomach. And then in the small intestines, um, the mucosa instead will look very different. It's going to have all these big finger-like projections that we call villi. And whenever you see these finger-like projections, I want you to think of the purpose of these finger-like projections. And the purpose of these finger-like projections is to maximize surface area. And in the small intestines, it's especially important because the small intestines fun are functioning for absorption of nutrients. So we're going to maximize our surface area for absorption of nutrients. So if you can imagine, you know, 
here could be the wall of the small intestines right here, okay? And this would be the surface area that we have to absorb nutrients across. Or, okay, um, the wall of the small intestines can look like this. And now, look at this. We about double the surface area that we have to absorb nutrients, because look, now we can absorb nutrients all across here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. So that's the purpose of having these finger-like projections, is they really maximize our surface area. And what's really cool then is if you zoom in on these villi and you look at the individual cells here um, that make up the outer layer of these little finger-like projections, the villi, if we zoom in on these cells, these cells themselves actually have finger-like projections. So you have finger-like projections on the finger-like projections. So we call these little things sticking up from the individual cells microvilli. And again, it's just a way to maximize surface area. So again, we have the finger-like projections to maximize surface area, and then all along lining here, we have microvilli to help maximize surface area. So again, it's pretty amazing when you think about, again, the anatomy of the body and how efficient it is. Again, this is just an example of that, of how our form matches the function and how efficient um, it can be. So this is kind of cool. This is just a, an actual slide of a cross section through an esophagus. And here you can see um, the four different tunics. Well, you see at least three different tunics. Um, the fourth one is tough to see because the, the serosa is pretty, um, it's pretty chunked up there. But here you can see, um, here that nice purple layer is the mucosa. So you, and here they've zoomed in so that you can really see the mucosa a little bit better here. Um, but this, this would be the mucosa. And then the layer of tissue back here would be the, all the submucosa. So this is all the submucosa here. And then here, this is the muscularis layer right here. And um, you can see, oh, I'm sorry, this whole thing here is the muscularis layer. Um, and you can see this layer is the circular layer of muscle. And then this layer is the longitudinal layer of muscle. So um, there's the muscularis, and then this outer layer here, which is kind of damaged, would be the serosa. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how we propel food through the alimentary canal. Mm. The motor functions of the alimentary canal are of two major types. We have mixing movements and we have propelling movements. And so we'll talk about these mixing movements being mostly a process that we call segmentation. And this is really um, to help mix food in with digestive enzymes. So you'll see the stomach, one of the major movements that we see in the stomach is of course going to be the mixing movements. And then the propelling movements are mainly um, by a process that we call peristalsis. So this is just to propel food through the digestive tract. And to do that, um, what we do is we have these waves of contraction that we call peristalsis. And these waves of contraction just literally they follow right behind the food bolus as it gets pushed down to help continue to push it down even farther into the alimentary canal. So here you can actually see the example, these examples of the two different types of movements. Obviously, this is um, the mixing movement. So this is a movement that we call segmentation. That's our mixing movement here. And then this movement is our wave of contraction that's pushing a food bolus down further in the digestive tract. And this is called peristalsis. All right, so now let's go ahead and we're gonna take you um, from mouth to anus. So, um, and as we go through the alimentary canal, we're gonna stop along the way and we'll talk about some of these accessory organs um, as we get there. So the mouth is um, the first portion of the alimentary canal and its main function of course is to receive food and then to begin mechanical digestion and it begins this mechanical digestion by mastication. So mastication is just simply that process of chewing up your food, okay? That's all mastication is, formal word for mechanically chewing up or grinding up your food with your teeth. 
Um, and we're so we're going to talk about just so you know in the mouth. Um, not only do we start mechanical digestion, but we also start chemical digestion as well. And we'll talk about that in just a minute when we talk about uh, saliva. So in the in the mouth, we actually start both processes of digestion, both mechanical and chemical. This picture is really more for your use um, for lab. I'm not going to necessarily test you on the parts of the mouth here for lecture, um, but it it at least is a good picture for you for lab that shows you the hard palate, soft palate, the, the uvula back here, um, the palatine tonsils, which you can see, and so on. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about um, some structures in the mouth. So obviously the tongue is a very important structure in the mouth. Um, it's covered by our taste buds that lie within these little structures that stick up called papillae. And um, so again, when we look at the tongue, let me see if I can show you here. Oops, I went too far. Excuse, excuse my bark, my dog's barking here. <laughs> Sorry about that. I apologize. Um, so if you if you look here, you can see um, all of the um, the papilla here, and these papilla are going to house um, the taste buds. They're also going to be very important for um, basically helping the tongue to move food around in the mouth as well. So those are what those papilla look like. And then when we look at how the tongue is actually attached to the mouth, the tongue is attached to the floor of the mouth by a structure called the frenulum. Um, and as I said here, the papilla are also going to provide some friction. Um, they kind of act like sandpaper, right? So they're going to provide some friction for helping to move food around in the mouth. Also, um, again, in the mouth, we have to talk about some of these structures, um, especially, specifically, the tonsils. So we have the palatine tonsils, the lingual tonsils, and the pharyngeal tonsils. The um, pharyngeal tonsils are also often more commonly called the adenoids. So let's look at where these tonsils are. So if you were to identify where all these tonsils are, when we typically say the word tonsils, like, oh, your tonsils look red, we're usually referring to the palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils are the ones that you can see when you open your mouth back here. So when you open your mouth wide, um, back there on either side of the uvula, you're going to see the palatine tonsils there. Okay? Um, the lingual tonsils okay, are back here, so you're not going to see the lingual tonsils. And um, then the pharyngeal tonsils are way up here. Okay. So, um, that gives you an idea of where all your tonsils are. Now, what, I apologize because I should have included this um, on, on um, this slide. Just so you know, tonsils, um, the function of them is they are mostly have an immune function. So tonsils consist mostly of lymphatic tissue and um, they're basically a, a way for our immune system to survey and also act as a first line of defense to pull out bacteria and viruses and, and foreign agents that are entering the mouth. So that's the main function of tonsils. They have an immune role and again they're mostly lymphatic tissue. Okay, so now let's talk about our teeth, right? Teeth are important for um, mechanical digestion. So when we look at our teeth, um, we end up, throughout our lifetime, we end up with two sets of teeth that develop in our sockets, um, in our maxilla and mandible. And these sockets that hold our teeth are called the alveolar processes. So literally the alveolar processes, guys, it's real simple. They're just a little indentation, um, indentations in your mandible and maxible where your teeth are going to fit. Okay? Um, so those are, I apologize again for my, my dog's parking here, um, but those are the, um, those are the al alveolar processes, real simple. 
And so throughout your life, you're going to have two sets of teeth that are going to develop in those alveolar sockets. Um, you're going to have your primary teeth as a child. So we end up with 20 primary teeth as a child. And then eventually, um, at a certain age, we start to shed those teeth and we actually lose them in the order that they appeared. Kind of interesting. And um, then they will be replaced by our, second, our secondary adult teeth and we end up with 32 secondary adult teeth. So the teeth, of course, again, are important because they start the mechanical digestion process. And when we look at a tooth, a tooth is actually held in the alveolar process by something called a periodontal ligament. And let me show you, um, I'll come back to that slide in just a minute, what the periodontal ligament is. So here you can see, here is the alveolar process. This, again, this indentation or socket where the tooth will lie. And so this is actually all bone here, okay? So the alveolar process is this indentation in the bone. And what holds the tooth in the alveolar process is the periodontal ligament. So that's all this stuff right here. This is all the periodontal ligament. And again, that's the ligament that holds the tooth in place. Now when we look at the tooth, um, we can break the tooth um, up into two major parts. The portion that's exposed is called the crown. Okay, so that would be the portion above the gingiva that's exposed. And then the portion below the gingiva is called the root. Now when we look at the crown, um, the crown consists of this outer layer called enamel. This is the outer shiny layer okay, of your tooth called the enamel, the smooth outer layer. And now underneath the enamel is a, a really tough layer, much tougher layer called dentin. And this dentin is going to run all the way from the crown down into the root. And that dentin again makes up the bulk of the tooth and is really a very, very tough material. Now inside the dentin there is going to run what's called the pulp cavity. And this pulp cavity is going to carry all the blood vessels and the lymph and the nerve, um, the nerves that run right through the middle of that tooth. Um, so oftentimes, again, we'll call this uh, the portion of the pulp cavity in the root. We call it the root canal. So that gives you a, a little bit of a breakdown of um, the anatomy of a tooth. Now, when we talk about um, our adult teeth, um, we actually use something called a dental formula. And we use this for other species as well, because so we can use dental formulas to actually help us identify certain species of animals. And our dental formula is going to be 2 to 1 to 2 to 3. So I'll explain this here in just a minute. So what we do is um, to come up with a dental formula, we kind of take the you know upper or the lower half of the mouth and break it in half. Okay, and we look and we say, we're going to count up how many incisors we have, how many um, cuspids or canines, you'll also hear that called, canines, again, in, mainly in other um, animals, and then our bicuspids and our molars. So in this case, in humans, we have, adult humans, we have two incisors, we have one cuspid, we have two bicuspids, or what we call it oftentimes our premolars, and three molars. Okay, So that's why our dental formula is two to one to two to three. So, and hint, hint, do make sure that you know the dental formula. You should know the dental formula um, for, for humans. Okay, salivary glands. So remember, we also talked about the fact that chemical digestion starts in the mouth. So we have accessory glands that help us along the way in our process of chemical digestion. And the salivary glands um, are going to be the glands that are our accessory glands, in this case, that are involved with chemical digestion. And the salivary glands are important for secreting saliva, lo and behold, right? <laughs> um, isn't it nice when they name things after what they do? So salivary glands secrete saliva. 
And saliva mainly consists of mucus and enzymes that, again, start the, pro the process of digestion. And the main enzyme that we find in saliva is what we call salivary amylase. Amylase is an enzyme, remember enzymes, um, you can always recognize an enzyme by looking at the suffix ASE. ASE tells us, tells us that this is an enzyme. So amylase actually tells us that this is an enzyme that breaks down amylose. And amylose is starch. Um, so if you wanted to experience some um, carbohydrate digestion firsthand, um, and if you're brave enough to do this, um, then what you can do is you can actually take a unsalted, it has to be unsalted, um, salting cracker. And, and this is great to have your kids do if you have young kids, because young kids will you know, always be willing to do something like this. Um, and it's a great kind of little experiment for them. But what you can do is you have them or yourself chew up this saltine cracker and you really let your saliva mix in really well with it. And what you do is you spit it out. Sounds gross, I know, but spit it out into a cup and then you let it sit there for a little bit. And what's gonna happen is the salivary amylase is actually gonna start to break down that starch and it'll break down that starch into maltose. And so what happens is then when you eat it again a few minutes later, it's going to taste sweet. It'll taste sweeter than it did the first time because you're going to be tasting that broken down starch now into maltose. You'll taste some of that maltose. So again, kind of a fun experiment to experience um, salivary amylase firsthand if, if you can stomach it. <laughs> So now the salivary glands that are secreting the saliva, we actually have three sets of salivary glands. We have the parotid glands. The parotid glands are going to be right here underneath the ears here. And then we have the submandibular um, glands. The submandibular glands are going to be down here, just like they sound submandibular below the mandible. And then we have the sublingual glands, which are going to be right underneath the tongue. Those are sublingual glands. So all three of these glands have ducts that will dump into the mouth and release again enzymes and mucus. So these are just this is just another um, again diagram to show you all three of the glands. There's the parotid gland here. Um, here's the sublingual gland, and here's the submandibular gland. And again, this was the picture that we looked at before: parotid gland, sublingual gland and submandibular. Okay, so once food um, moves from the mouth, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the swallowing action, how the tongue will push the food back into the mouth, then um, the food will be moved into the pharynx. And the pharynx is this cavity that lies right behind the mouth here. Um, and the pharynx will lead the food into the esophagus. Um, the esophagus is this nice muscular tube that will lead all the way down into the stomach. So when we look at the pharynx, remember that the pharynx here actually can be broken up into three different sections. We have the nasopharynx, which is going to be the portion of the pharynx right behind the nasal cavity. The oropharynx, which is of course going to be the um, portion of the pharynx that's right behind the oral cavity. So up here would be the nasopharynx, here would be the oropharynx. And so nasopharynx up here, oropharynx here, and then the laryngeopharynx would be right here. So the portion of the um, pharynx that will lead into the larynx and the esophagus. So swallowing mechanism, really easy, okay? Um, our swallowing reflexes can be divided up into three major stages. The first one is that food is going to be forced into the pharynx with the tongue. So that's how we push the food back into the pharynx, is with our big muscular tongue. Then there are sensory receptors inside the pharynx that actually sense that there's food in the pharynx now, and they're going to trigger the swallowing reflex, and um, they'll also help to trigger the peristaltic contractions. So when they trigger this swallowing reflex, guys, this is very important because the swallowing reflex is what's going to pull up um, the trachea so that it pushes up against the epiglottis and closes the trachea off. 
okay? And so that epiglottis little flap is gonna cover the trachea as we swallow, as the, that's pulled, the trachea is pulled up, and then the food will be directed into the esophagus. So again, remember that the laryngeopharynx actually can lead into either the larynx or the esophagus. And so we really need that epiglottis to cover the trachea, or, or I should say the larynx, really. Um, so that way then food doesn't enter the larynx and eventually the trachea. And then peristaltic contractions are going to help transport that food into the esophagus and the esophagus then to the stomach. So again, this is the a nice example of the, the swallowing mechanism. So here in this um, diagram here, you can see the we have this upper esophageal sphincter, and um, at the point that the food bolus is in the mouth, that's contracted. Now, as um, the tongue pushes the food back into the pharynx and the swallowing reflex is initiated, that upper esophageal sphincter is going to relax. And now, as you can see, the, when the swallowing reflex again is initiated, you can see that here um, the larynx is pulled up um, into that flap over the esophagus, so here's the, the epiglottis, um, or I'm sorry, the, um, that flap called the epiglottis, not esophagus, um, that flap here called the epiglottis um, will then close off the larynx. So literally the, the larynx is pulled up and pushed into the epiglottis and that flap completely covers um, the, that flap completely covers then the larynx. So now the food bolus can only move um, down into the uh, esophagus. So if you look here again in this diagram, before the swallowing reflex is initiated, you know the larynx is open as well as, um, and the esophagus is closed. Once the swallowing init swallowing reflex is initiated, then the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes and the epiglottis covers the larynx, and that allows that food bolus to be directed right into the esophagus then the upper esophageal sphincter will start to contract as the food bolus moves past it, and we'll see our wave of peristaltic contractions. And the wave of peristaltic contractions will continue to push that food bolus down, all the way down the esophagus into the stomach. Okay, so the stomach. The stomach is going to be this big J-shaped muscular organ. And the stomach is very important for receiving, obviously, food from the esophagus, but then mixing that food with digestive juices, and then eventually propelling it into the small intestines. Now, if you were to look at the inside of a stomach here, you would see all of these big circular folds in the mucosa. These are called the rugi, okay? Rugi, or these muscular folds of um, the stomach. And they're very important for helping um, to churn the food in with all of the digestive juices here. We have the what's called the lower esophageal sphincter or the gastroesophageal sphincter up here. Um, so I like the word gastroesophageal because the word gastric means stomach. So gastroesophageal sphincter, that word tells you that it's a sphincter in between the stomach and the esophagus. And then the pyloric sphincter is going to be the sphincter at the end of the stomach, in between the stomach and the small intestines, especially the duodenum of the small intestines. And so the pyloric sphincter, again, will be at the end of the stomach here. So, and basically, the just to give you an idea of what the function of each of these is, the gastroesophageal sphincter is going to close to prevent food, a food bolus, from flowing back into the esophagus. And then here, or especially when it releases acid, it becomes acid chyme. We don't want that acid chyme moving back into the esophagus. That's what we call reflux. Um, so that was a gastroesophageal sphincter failure. And then um, the pyloric sphincter will help to prevent food from moving from the duodenum, when it moves into the duodenum, back into um, the stomach. So once we push food on into the duodenum, we don't want it moving back. So it's to prevent backflow of that food into the stomach.
So that's the main purpose of those two different sphincters. So again, this is just showing you the same thing. Here's your lower um, esophageal sphincter, or what I like to call the gastroesophageal sphincter. And then here you can see all the rugi, the muscular folds of the stomach. And then um, here at the end here, you'll see the pyloric sphincter here um, at the end of the stomach leading into the duodenum. So gastric secretions, obviously um, the stomach is going to be very important in terms of doing some chemical digestion. So to do, to do this chemical digestion, we have these gastric glands that lie within the mucosa of the stomach and uh, they're going to op open into these gastric pits. So these gastric glands are kind of deep in, at the surface here. So the gastric glands are way down here, deep at the surface. And then they'll open up into these gastric pits that then open up into the lumen of the stomach here. So again, here would be the gastric gland, here would be the pit. And the gastric glands generally are going to contain three different types of secretory cells. They're going to contain mucus cells that... Lo and behold, secrete mucus, right? <laughs> and then um, we have our chief cells that are going to secrete pepsin. And pepsin is a major enzyme um, that's important for digesting proteins. So one of the major things that happens in the stomach is that it's the beginning of the digestion for proteins. This is where we really start to break down proteins. And then we have the parietal cells, and the parietal cells are going to release hydrochloric acid. Yeah, your stomach produces hydrochloric acid and um, something called intrinsic factor. Now, what's interesting is this hydrochloric acid is actually required to activate this pepsin enzyme. So, um, so they kind of go hand in hand. The pepsin needs the hydrochloric acid to become active and start to break down proteins. And then the intrinsic factor um, is an important factor required for vitamin B12 absorption. So um, vitamin B12 is a very important vitamin in the body, and we'll talk about at the very end um, all of the important things that vitamin B12 does, but it's important for um, the nervous system, it's important for um, blood formation, so it's important for many different um, functions in the body. And it's so important that um, we end up secreting this substance called intrinsic factor that helps helps us absorb the vitamin B12 um, in the small intestine. So again, it's these parietal cells that release that intrinsic factor. So here you can see this is, um, this is a little diagram basically of what these gastric pits and gastric glands look like. So here is a gastric gland and if you look at the gastric gland you can see it's going to have all these secretory cells so it's going to have um, chief cells that are going to be secreting pepsin and then it's going to have these big parietal cells that are going to secrete hydrochloric acid and remember it's kind of interesting to know that that hydrochloric acid actually activates that enzyme um, pepsin so normally it's released in its inactive form and in the presence of hydrochloric acid acid, it um, is converted into its active form where it actually can go start to cleave or break down proteins. So again, um, that pepsin needs that hydrochloric acid. And then we're also going to again um, have cells in here that will, will secrete mucus as well. And then um, the gastric glands are going to secrete all their digestive enzymes um, and mucus that will build up in here and flow into the gastric pit and then out into the lumen of the stomach. So, and this is just showing you again these gastric pits as well. So you can see where the gastric glands are down here leading into the gastric pits. And then here would be again the mucosa of the stomach. So, and these gastric, just so you know, these gastric glands are part of the mucosa of the stomach. So they're part of that outer lining, or I'm sorry, I should say the inner lining. So the lining that's closest to the lumen. So how do we regulate gastric secretions? So we're going to talk a lot about regulating secretions. We'll talk about how we regulate um, secretions from um, the pancreas and from the liver and then from um, the stomach. So again, gastric secretions are going to be secretions that are released in the stomach. And the hormone gastrin, isn't this nice? Again, they're naming the hormone after what it does. Um, so gastrin increases gastric secretion. 
So what happens is when the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, um, we will release gastrin into the bloodstream and that gastrin will then travel through the bloodstream back to the stomach where it will stimulate those gastric glands to um, start secreting again um, more enzymes, more pepsin, more hydrochloric acid. And so, again, it's pretty easy to remember. Now you get some crossover, right, some, from some of our earlier lectures that parasympathetic is going to be um, responsible for this because your parasympathetic system is your rest and, more importantly, your digest, right? Okay, so the digest portion of it is stimulating the release of gastrin. So the food entering the small intestine then um, is going to do just the opposite of gastrin. When food leaves the stomach and enters the small intestine, we, then we no longer need to release all of those gastric juices, right? Because food's leaving the stomach behind. So we actually want to decrease um, gastric secretions. So when food enters the small intestine, this is going to decrease gastric secretions. And one of the ways that it's going to do it is we're going to get the release of a substance called cholecystokinin. This is going to be abbreviated as CCK, cholecystokinin. Okay? And CCK will be released from the intestine and it will travel again um, through the bloodstream because it's a hormone and eventually back to the stomach to where it will then actually decrease or inhibit gastric secretions. And of course, the opposing sympathetic um, nervous system is what's going to stimulate the release of cholecystokinin.